By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 123, featuring Garrett Adelstein. Garrett is 35 years old and is originally from Tucson, Arizona, but he now lives in Los Angeles and spends his working days playing high-stakes cash games. And of course, when I say high-stakes cash games, these days I'm mostly talking about live-streamed high-stakes cash games. In fact, if you've watched any decent amount of streamed games in the last few years, there's a good to great chance that you saw Garrett who has made a name for himself as one of the top players on the so-called live stream circuit. Garrett is a regular competitor on both Live at the Bike and the Hustler Casino live stream, two broadcasted games that run regularly in Los Angeles, and he's also appeared on Poker After Dark. He's had numerous hands go viral over the years, never afraid to look bad by pulling a ridiculous bluff, uh, making a crazy hero call, or folding a monster. Of course, Garrett is no stranger to the cameras, having been a contestant on the CBS game show Survivor. He competed on Survivor Kagayan, the 28th season of the show back in 2013. And let's just say it didn't go great. We talk about that and how he got casted on the show. We talk about him uh, busting to Johnny Chan on ESPN. And we also talk about a very long flight home from a Houston Rockets playoff game. Anyway, that's enough intro. Here is my conversation with Garrett Adelstein. 35 still? 35, uh huh. Yep. I don't know if you know this, but Wikipedia has two different birthdays for you. Yeah, for sure. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm just fine with many people not knowing my real birthday, so I'm. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Either way, it doesn't matter. They both yeah. both dates passed. <laughs> for sure. <clears throat> Wikipedia is uh, it's like it's a nice little microcosm for how I view like all this in general and that like almost everything on there is uh incorrect and i have no interest <laughs> in trying to change it and sort of whatever narrative people have uh about me I i've kind of gotten over sort of trying to modify that in any way you know unfortunately a lot of people incorrectly kind of think i'm just like you know to use a word that's just overplayed like the goat and you know that's so far from the truth and yet it's uh not something I really care to try and, you know, convince people otherwise of at this point, sort of my reputation, you know, is what it is, um, despite it maybe not being the best always for, you know, getting into great live games and whatnot. So no, there, there is something to be said for being a man of mystery, right? Uh, <laughs> like that's why, that's why everyone reveres Ivy the way they do, you know, sure. cause, he re cause he refuses to talk. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Anyway, yeah. That a part of you know why i don't give too many interviews you know i think sometimes i self-consciously think like you know i really don't have that many brilliant things to say i really i really can't be doing like you know 50 hours of interviews a year and, and be giving people content that they care about you know but if i do one interview a year you know hopefully i say something of, of consequence that you know maybe can benefit people in some fashion so all right. Well, I hope it's this interview, and that's as good a transition as uh, as any to this uh, interview for the people listening at home. I'm here, of course, with with Garrett Adelstein. Garrett, uh, how you doing? How's doing how's your? <laughs> I was about to say summer. I was about to say how's your summer going, but it's not summer at all. It's November. Sure. No. It's uh, everything's going great. You know, I got married in the beginning of October, and congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. And I think sort of my marriage kind of coincides with 
really being in a very peaceful place uh, in in a lot of ways in my life, which certainly wasn't all, always the case, you know, as I sort of uh, struggled as most people do to figure out, you know, who they are and what they want out of life in their 20s. So. Oh, I definitely want to get into the 20s. But first, uh, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, you, were you born and raised in Tucson? For sure, yep. Born and raised, Northwest Tucson. Yeah, you would live growing up in uh, Tucson is probably the reason why you chose to live in uh, California instead of Las Vegas today, right? That that is right. Definitely, uh, L.A. is an imperfect city, uh, but you know, I know it's cliche to say, but the weather alone just like improves my quality of life. You were done with the desert. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, what were you getting into over in Tucson? So yeah, you know, growing up, I, I did well in school, and uh, I was Very always smart. Kind of, I was always kind of on track to uh, become a lawyer, actually. Um, and so, you know, when it came time to go to college, I was sort of debating between whether I wanted to, you know, basically pay like about half of my tuition for you know a great school, or if I wanted to just go to the University of Arizona, have them pay me, stay close to a lot of my friends. And so, you know, I went with the latter option. And so I went to the University of Arizona as well, you know, I had the time of my life there and sort of right, right around, you know, the, the summer before college was when I turned 18. And that's when I would kind of say my professional poker career. However, unprofessional, I acted <laughs> at the age of 18, <laughs> um, you know, kind of began. Um, and so, you know, I did that. Well, before uh, we before yeah, we get into poker, I gotta ask you because yeah, it's this year you were the valedictorian of your high school and you graduated with honors from college. I know University of Arizona was a was a party school. In fact, I think they were the number one party school for a little while. Um, how did that coincide with the studious Garrett? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, I think that question sort of exemplifies me as a person. You know, pretty well. I've always been someone into you know frat life and you know hard partying and chasing after girls and things of that nature when I was younger but I also was very interested in chess and poker uh and reading and and so I, I feel like I really sort of have like a, a dichotomy to me that that I, I guess is a little unique uh in that like I love a lot of let's say quote unquote fratty things but I love a lot of <laughs> Uh, you know, nerdy things as as well. So I think that sort of kind of always defined, you know, my childhood in some way. Uh, you're obviously in great shape. You showed it off on Survivor, which we'll get to later. Were you in good shape in high school too? Were you were you an athlete, or were you you know one of the the drama kids or <laughs> were you in the glee club? <laughs> uh, uh, obviously, you were probably winning all the 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 academic bowls and stuff, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, Definitely not drama, but yeah, no, growing up, uh, fitness uh, was always sort of like a very important part of my life, and uh, so so were sports, you know, I played, you know, five different sports growing up, finally settling on tennis and, and basketball, you know, in high school, um, and yeah, I think, um, you know, at a very young age, I think fitness became really important to me, I think sort of everyone when you're a teenager, like, kind of like doing well with girls and things of that nature is, is important. Not everyone, but I, I think a lot of people, it's something I care, <laughs> they care about. And, you know, the, one of the first ways I learned how to do that was to, you know, grow some muscle, be in good shape, things of that nature. And so that's really where it began uh, as admittedly superficial as, as that is. And, and that just kind of led to just like a, a lifelong, like love affair with, with fitness. And that's evolved over the years. You know, it used to be more bodybuilding. Now it's, more running which i find you know more intrinsically rewarding but certainly you know sports athletics fitness th these are all sort of you know there's not many things i feel like in one's life that they care a lot about like forever you know and uh and and fitness is definitely one of those things for me i just imagine every other guy hated you in high school i mean you literally were like the five tool student <laughs> <laughs> You know what yeah, I mean? Like I do, I do, and it, yeah, I, I think that's a, a good point too because I don't, I don't think I, I feel pretty confident actually. I did not have the emotional intelligence or or awareness to sort of recognize that I could be sort of threatening to people, and you know, as such, 
you know, in order to really connect with others, I think, you know, if, if you're if you're good at a couple things, you know, it can be helpful to sort of do and say things uh, that are disarming to people, particularly like when you first meet them or or whatever the case. And I, I feel like, you know, at that age, my teens, early 20s, I was anything but, you know, I was as braggadocious and obnoxious and, and all all these sort of negative adjectives you can use, like, you, you know, as they came, as they come. And uh, it, it definitely took, you know, um, me sort of recognizing that, you know, again, in, in my mid late 20s and, and adjusting, you know, accordingly, like in the end, you know, like whether someone's in better shape than someone else, or, you know, they're better at standardized tests than someone else, like, that doesn't, actually mean shit like you're not like a, a better human being your life isn't more worthwhile you're not going to you know be a better friend you know and the things that really matter in life uh, aren't really related to that at all you know and and so i think you know again over the last decade or or whatever that was when it really sort of hit home that sort of the value of my life or or what good i can do in the world you know i think starts first and foremost with treating everyone the right way, you know, every day, which is, um, again, not something I would say I was an expert at as a teenager. Well, I think especially in the poker community, there's a lot of people still trying to find that sense of uh, enlightenment. Uh, speaking of poker, you said you found it at 18. How was it your, your introduction there? Was it a uh, rounders? Was it a home game online? Sure. Yeah. I think I actually started about 16, you know, when ESPN started airing Moneymaker, you know, I, I know again, the most cliche thing ever, but alas, that is the facts in my case. And so, once, <laughs> Hey, <once> same here. <laughs> yeah. And so once, you know, Moneymaker started blowing up on her TV screens, like, you know, we ended up being able to get like 50 kids from my high school, like running home games, like three days a week, you know, and we play, 25 50 cent or you know if we're playing high stakes 50 cent dollar and uh, <laughs> admit, admittedly i just crushed those games which says absolutely nothing about my skill level now or even then because like most of them barely knew the rules but the point was like you know a lot of times i'd be playing and making two three four hundred dollars in a day which was an extravagant amount of money for me while also like having the time of my life and then from, <laughs> there, from there it really just became like you know the classic outlier sort of situation where the success, you know, bred success. And so I just became absolutely fascinated with it. Turned 18, started playing online poker, obsessed over content on two plus two. Uh, and, you know, poker really was just, it was an obsession for sure. And, and arguably an unhealthy one from, from ages about 17 to maybe 25 uh, for me, where, where kind of my whole life was, uh, you know, poker in, in one form or another. How did it affect your education at the University of Arizona and your plans for a career? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I did thankfully still like invest heavily in my social life in college, which I'm so grateful for. Uh, I had just like so much fun. In fact, like I went back to Scottsdale, Arizona last weekend to watch uh, my Arizona Cardinals get blown out at home by the Panthers. <laughs> which was a great time, let me tell you. But it's like, after college, and I'll promise I'll answer your question with it, I lived in Scottsdale <laughs> for a few years as well till I turned 25. But just grouping those college years and the few years after together, like, they were just some of the best years of my life. I had so much fun socially, and you know, I'm, now I'm an old 35-year-old married guy, and I don't feel like I missed out you know, on any of that stuff. Like, I, I really enjoyed it. I had fun. So, you know, my life really was just like my social life, my friends, you know, et cetera, going out admittedly. Uh, and so, so you weren't like, you know, you weren't like in a basement clicking online poker buttons, smoking a pack a day, drinking Red Bulls, trying to get, you know, 20 hours a day. in. so it, it, right. it didn't negatively affect you that in that way. No, 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 no. I probably just gave like 40 hours a, a week to both things, you know, but like, Honestly, anytime I wasn't really doing anything social, it was it was poker, you know, like uh, and, you know, school wasn't particularly challenging. It, it didn't require that many hours, which, again, is not something I'm really trying to brag about. I went to the University of Arizona, which is a very mediocre state school. Um, but, you know, to go Wildcats, <laughs> go, go Wildcats. Yeah, I adore my school, uh, particularly from an athletic standpoint. But, you know, it is what it is academically. Um, but uh 
you know, as, as that relates to sort of your question and, you know, my career trajectory, you know, I was always going to go to law school and, you know, we fast forward to, you know, the summer before my senior year, you know, I started studying for the LSATs, you know, took those, was happy with my score. It was good enough to get into uh, a top 10 law school. And I remember I just couldn't get my personal statement written. I, all of Q1, I just stalled it, stalled it, stalled it off all the way up until I remember all my closest friends were driving to Phoenix to go to a Chris Rock concert. Uh, and I go, guys, I, I cannot go. I have to write this thing tonight. Uh, and, you know, for forgive me if, if anyone listening has heard this story before, but I stared at my computer for hours, hours. And then, you know, it, it was like 2 a.m. And I said, I had written like a sentence, you know, and I said, this is like a sign. You know, I'm not a religious guy, anything like that. But it was just something deep inside me telling me, like, you cannot go to law school or at least yeah. like, not yet. <laughs> you know, and so I had this very loose play out of, of taking one more year to play online poker. Uh, and then, you know, one more year became <laughs> what is now like whatever it is, 16 years. Uh, and, uh, I don't know if my parents are listening. Don't worry, mom. I'll, I'll still head I'll still head to law school one day. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to ask, you know, your parents raised like this model kid who like excelled at everything, especially academics. How did they feel when you came to them and said, Hey, I'm going to try to be an, a professional poker player. For sure. Yeah. That's actually a pretty legit story. Like I kind of hid that from them that I was even considering it for a long time. And it probably wasn't until a couple months after I didn't send in, you know, my law school, uh, applications, um, that like, you know, I took them for lunch over like Christmas and, uh, I just like just blurted it out. I said, "Guys, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to law school. Like, uh, I enjoy poker too much. It's been too lucrative for me. Like, I'm going to take this year uh, and and keep playing, you know, online poker." And they both just broke down into tears. Like they were just <laughs> they were just heartbroken, you know. And and by the end of the conversation, it really wasn't that much better. And you know, now we talk about it and we laugh and, you know, they're, they're very proud of my life choices and they're, they're super proud that, you know, maybe like I've even been able to do a small amount of good as a poker player, which I think is, uh, you know, quite a challenging thing to, to do in, in a zero sum game. Um, but it was, it was very touch and go for, for the first few years, not because they had a problem with me playing poker. In fact, they, they were always like proud of that and, you know, happy that I found success, but I think sort of just education and a more stable career, um, I think were, were just things at the time that they valued immensely. Hey, you mentioned doing good uh, with the game. Uh, I was reading on, on your Twitter about the charity drive you did. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I do a lot of those. You know, I a lot of my philanthropy work revolves around the Big Brother, Big Sister um, program, specifically in uh, Los Angeles. And so I've had a little for about five years. His name's Callie, um, great kid. And basically the, the program for anyone who might be interested, I always want to give it a plug is you end up getting paired with a little, and then the two of you just like hang out, have fun, you know, take them to do fun things, whether it's, you know, small stuff, just like going to sky zone or lunch or, you know, you take them to Disneyland, whatever. And so, you know, uh, a couple times a month for the last five years or whatnot, like, you know, we just hang out occasionally. My wife comes with us, uh, and it, it's just a lot of fun. And it allows, you know, a lot of kids in in underserved communities have a male role model, and so you know, it's just been it's just been great. You know, on the the financial side of it, you know, I usually run one or two charity drives a year for one thing or another. You know, for my wedding, it seemed sort of like an obvious one. You know, I don't. My wife probably wouldn't be thrilled if I said this, but I mean, the the truth is, <laughs> you know, weddings are rather extravagant. You know, and I always kind of had mixed feelings about us, you know, doing, you know, sort of this like big fun wedding. Now we only had 60 guests. We purposely kept it super small, but you know, we did do like a week of activities for everyone and things of that nature. And I don't know, sometimes doing things like that makes me feel, I have mixed feelings about it, you know? So I was like, let's make sure we do a, uh, you know, a charity drive for that. So, you know, by the end of the drive, we, we raised, I think it was right around like $12,500 um, you know, 5,000 of that coming from Jen and I, and, um, yeah, you, you know, I, I think philanthropy's really added quite a lot to my life. I think when I think about sort of why I live with a lot more peace than I did five years ago or 10 years ago, 
I do think one of the major pieces to that is I wake up each day now feeling like me being on earth makes the world a better place. Now I'm not saying, mm. I'm not saying to some extreme extent or, you know, I'm Elon Musk or please, please don't take it that way. I have no sort of sense of grandiosity in, in, in this way. Um, but in at least some very, very small way, I think that I do more good than harm, you know, being on earth these days. And uh, I mean, it, it really, it really helps, you know, it really helps sort of me with meaning. It really helps me sort of continue to want to play poker, um, you know, knowing in, in one form or another, whether it's, you know, giving advice to fellow poker players struggling with mental health issues, whether it's taking some of that income to do good for philanthropy, friends, family, et cetera. Um, all of these things really, you know, make me, you know, very motivated basically to get up and have a day, which, which admittedly wasn't always sort of the, the easiest thing for me, you know, and I think my wife and I really share in that thought when we think of like our life mission, you know, we've been so fortunate in our life to have so many things, you know, we know that that many people don't. And so I think we really wake up each day with the thought of like, what can we do, you know, for again, friends, family, etc., to make, you know, their lives better. And I, w I would yeah. challenge anyone to sort of adapt a similar mindset. Uh, even if you're the most selfish person in the world, you know, because it's just so rewarding if, if you can look in the mirror and sort of feel that way about yourself, you know, on, on any level. So, yeah, you could do good for selfish reasons and still produce good. Uh, I Absolutely. always look at poker players, you know, using the NBA's plus minus system, you know, because mm -hmm. poker is one of those careers and, and people could argue this, that it, it, I mean, I don't know if it, benefits society to be a poker player you know what i mean um so you have to find other ways to at least not be a drag on society you know and i, I look at poker players the same way is he a, is he a positive person is he a negative person <laughs> away from the felt yeah so. ab absolutely you know and you know in defense of poker and that's not my favorite pastime defending poker. Like there are quite a lot of careers that are zero sum, quite a lot. Oh, of, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that don't do, you know, a lot of good. And so, yeah, I certainly think when you are in one of these, you know, many, many industries, it really like rests on you to make sure like you're making choices, you know, actions, the way you treat people, et cetera, uh, to ensure like, again, not just for society, but again, for yourself that you feel like, Hey, like, you know, I'm a net, net contributor to the world, which is why it's like, it's all, I'm always curious to learn about like people who do the shittiest things in poker and like, just to like, try to try to get in their head and understand like where, where they're coming from. Because I, I just don't even understand how like a series of choices like that could bring, you know, someone additional meaning, you know, but that's right. the or there. And as I have a tendency to do, I can, go off on wild philosophical stuff. <laughs> That's so <all> good. <laughs> Let, let's try to stay, stick a little closer to the best here. <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, all of that sounded like the very level-headed thoughts of a, of a mature 35-year-old. I want to go back to those first few years as a pro in Tucson. What kind of games were you into? What were you doing? Obviously, you weren't much of a tournament player. You've always pretty much stuck to cash. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So, so again, if we transition from you know, the small stakes, home games and cash to online, you know, when you first start playing online, you don't know what the hell to do, you know, like, and so I played everything, you know, I played s small stakes, cash, sit and goes, big MTTs, you know, and everything in between. Uh, and it wasn't again until I really started, I found two plus two. And I read this book, I remember when I was very young, and it was called Mastery. And it was just this incredible book for me at the time, which basically just talks about like, there's all sorts of smart people in the world. But like, most of them end up really struggling because they keep jumping from one shiny object to another throughout their life. Uh, and so the concept of mastery or specifically like specialization, not just in poker, not just even in no limit poker, but let's say online six max cash, no limit. Mm. Um, these are things that, that I've kind of done in a variety of fields, professional and otherwise in my life. Um, meaning like to have the discipline to specialize in something and then, you know, stick with it. Um, so, you know, to your question, it was, you know, started small stakes and then, you know, rose all the way up to high stakes, six max cash um, for those first couple of years. And then when I was around 20, 
Uh, I got really drunk one night, ended up playing this world-class heads-up player. His name was Holland Goal for anyone who's been around forever. Uh, mm. Ended up beating him out of like 10 or 15 buy-ins, just hammered drunk. Uh, and I convinced myself I was the best heads-up player in the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course, I was awful, you know, but what it did was it sparked a new passion in sort of um, a micro economy that was really growing, which was heads up, no limit. You know, I think heads up tables had only been around a very short period of time. And so I started just putting all my resources into becoming the best heads up player I could. Uh, And that kind of lasted basically all the way, you know, up until Black Friday. And so that's kind of the evolution of my online career, which almost amazingly only represents sort of the first half (laughs) <laughs> of my poker career as a whole. Yeah, and then in 20 years, we're going to have to do this again and <laughs> revisit the second half. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of hope not, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so you're playing um, poker. When did you get cast on Survivor? Or how did you get cast on Survivor? Yeah, so this story is almost like borderline <laughs> embarrassing, but like, you know, it is what it is. You know, at that time, like, I was very much into bodybuilding, so I, I, stood, I stood out in a crowd, you know, quite a bit, and I was at um, this bar. Oh, people should Google you right now. Go ahead and Google Garrett, especially his survivor photos, uh, because what we're going to talk about later will confuse you. Uh, <laughs> he was clearly, well, we'll talk about it. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, no worries. So I was just at this uh, trendy bar in Venice called The Whaler, and... Uh, You know, a couple people come up to me, one middle-aged guy, one, you know, mid-20s girl, and they say, hey, can we chat with you for a minute? And I said, sure. And so they go outside, and they say, we're with the reality TV show Survivor. Have you heard of it? And honestly, I feel like they're, like, trying to scam me. You know, like, I don't even really believe what they're saying at the time, you know? (laughs) Of course, like, I've heard of Survivor. You know, like, it's still a big show, but, you know, whatever it was, eight years when I was on, you know, you could still kind of remember like the first few seasons where it was, you know, the biggest show on television. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they just started asking me some questions that I felt comfortable answering. They weren't particularly personal, uh, you know, just about my career and whatever. And you could see their eyes light up when I told them I was a professional poker player. Uh, This was well after John Robert Belland um, was on Survivor China and he was, you know, uh, a great character and, Basically, just a poker player in general has a lot of attributes that they were looking for. Now, at this point, I don't know because we Survivor players have been so piss poor at the game. That I don't even I don't even know if they're looking right. For right. Maybe, the maybe they're poker players have us. not fared well. <laughs> right. Maybe they're looking for us as sort of the anti heroes, right? But anyway, for one reason or another, it was very obvious they were they were very interested in me after I you know said that. Um, and so they you know we talked for a while and they said you know give us a minute. They went and talked, and they said, all right, here's what we want to do. We're halfway through finals week. We've had several people that, you know, didn't pan out. They're not what we're looking for. We'd love to invite you tomorrow morning to come stay at, you know, and it was like this nice hotel in Santa Monica for, you know, the rest of the week, another four nights, whatever, where you'll basically be, like, isolated from all the other potential cast, and, like, you'll just be doing, like, a series of tests, interviews, et cetera, for, for days to, to see if, if, you know, we want to cast you for the show. Uh, and it was at that point that like, I was, I was well aware that like, this was legit. Uh, and honestly, I said, let me think about it. <laughs> I wasn't really, I wasn't really, I wasn't really sure, you know, and then I went home, you know, and oh, they told me not to tell anyone, you know, but I, I went ahead and called like, you know, a couple people that were super close to me and told them like, the situation and they go, are you kidding me, bro? Like you have to try this. Like you have to give us your shot. And like those calls really like, you know, invigorated me. And so, you know, I, you know, shot him a text that night and said, I'm in. And next thing I knew I was at that hotel, you know, at 8 a.m. the next day. And a few days later, all the finals casting went, you know, super well. And it was filled with all sorts of really cool, fun moments where I'm in a room with, you know, the CEO of CBS and Jeff Probst and Mark Burnett uh, and, you know, my handler, if you will, from casting said, I mean, you nailed it, like, y- you're in the cast, like, we can't announce it, you know, publicly, like, you're in the cast, don't tell anyone, here's when you leave, you know, and then I had to wait another year before we finally actually left, 
Um, and you know, that's a not, year. That's not yeah. It, it was crazy. Like it was supposed to only be like eight months or something. And then they ended up switching my season and the one before it. they filmed that one first. Cause it was like a returning player season and they needed to cater to the schedules of a few of those returning players. So us new players like got bumped like an extra, whatever it was, you know, I couldn't that. imagine sitting on that for a year. It was crazy. Yeah. Well, then after you played, it was like another six months after that before they aired our season. So in summation, it was like a year and a half where I had to keep like all of this stuff a secret, which was interesting and, and challenging, you know, because obviously, you know, spoiler alert now, like it, it didn't go very well. And so you know, <laughs> I, come, I come back and, you know, I also have to know that I'm going to have to relive this again in six months. And then I kind of had to relive it again to some small extent when Netflix put you know, my season up and, you know, put me as like the, in the trailer of it and, you know, <laughs> but it, it's all good. You know, I hope the viewers well, that's are, flattering. It, it is. I, I hope the viewers are able to hear sort of the, you know, the inflections in my voice in terms of like, it was, I look back now, just such a cool, novel, positive experience for me, despite it, you know, not really going well. And I mean, it's just something obviously very few people can say they, got the opportunity to do. And so, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful for it. And yeah, I, I think it's kind of cool at this point, even though for years I was, I was honestly rather embarrassed about it. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the show because it was Survivor Kag- Kagayan. Sure. Yep. I'm yeah. Philipp- you in the Philippines. You're, you're very close. Yep. Yeah. So this is the Philippines and the season was three teams, brains, brawn and beauty. And as we've determined, in high school, you had all three. Um, you were in the brain section. But mm-hmm. I'm looking at the cast photo, and I'm going, he probably belongs in the brawn section as well. I sure would have liked to have been in the brawn section. Much much <laughs> weaker, less manipulative, less cutthroat players on that brawn team that season. For those <laughs> of you who uh, watched it, I mean, Wu being one of many examples of, like, would have loved to play Survivor with Wu instead of Cass, you know, but alas, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, for, you know, for those that don't know, you, uh, you know, it didn't go well. You were voted out second after about a week on the island. What was that week like? Uh, pretty brutal or? Yeah, it was, it was super trends? brutal. Yeah, I was really surprised actually at how like even my mental health deteriorated quite a bit, you know, like uh, I had trained super hard for Survivor. I was just so used to like eating every two or three hours. And so when all of a sudden I couldn't exercise, when all of a sudden, like, instead of, you know, like eating three, 4,000 calories of clean food a day, I was eating just nothing. Um, It it really affected my mental health. I think it probably affected my play as a result quite a bit. And it was just, uh, it was just a really challenging week. You know, it it is what it is. There's no, no excuses. Everyone else was going through the same thing. but, uh, yeah, it wasn't fun. I was in great shape. I still lost 12 pounds anyway, somehow. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, next thing I knew, I was at uh, Ponderosa for two weeks doing a lot of nothing. And then we had a three-week trip to Thailand, which in theory sounds incredible. And it certainly had its moments. But I think at the time, I was just so disappointed in myself. It was really hard to enjoy sort of any of the rest of that experience once I was voted off. Yeah, I can imagine. Your quote is saying that you sucked at Survivor. Do you feel that that, that was the case now, or do you think maybe you were viewed as a, as a threat right from the beginning, given the fact that you looked like you did in the brain section? <laughs> no, no, I sucked at Survivor. No, let's, let's, <laughs> let's call a spade a spade here. Yeah, I, uh, no, I, I didn't play well, you know. Um, I maybe had, like, a, a pretty vast sort of technical knowledge of, of the right moves to make at various, you know, sort of permutations in the game. Um, but, you know, I think at that age, I really struggled from an emotional intelligence standpoint, you know, even right from my, you know, vote out, like, I'd like to think, you know, me now, I think I would have been able to, you know, handle cast with kid gloves a lot better, um, ensured that, you know, her and I really were working together, you know, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's the only other thing I would say is, you know, without question, there is like a truly insane amount of variance in Survivor. Um, you combine that with production for every individual character is generally going to lean towards giving them a positive or negative edit, which isn't really to make an excuse. But the point is, like, 
it's not totally as black or white as it looks. But with that said, it's no big deal. I got the edit I did. I came across the way I did. It's obviously a natural human tendency uh, for people to try to simplify reality and go good person, bad person, good player, bad player. And so, you know, I'm, I wasn't sort of, or at least I'll say now, I look back retrospectively and I wasn't sort of annoyed with the way I was portrayed or, or the way the public, you know, saw me. And I think more importantly, at this point in my life, I know like it just doesn't matter at all. <laughs> you know, these, these are not things that matter. You know, the only reason this should bother you is if, if you let it, you know, and yeah. Thankfully, well, you know, uh, uh, you're not the only, doesn't. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You're not the only poker player who, who struggled on that show, obviously. Um, but I do wonder if a poker player can even theoretically win that show, given if they tell people they're a poker player. We had um, uh, Jackie Glazier on the show, on the uh-huh. podcast, and she was talking about her experience on Survivor Australia and how she refused to tell them that she was a poker player. And in fact, she told them she was a professional Rubik's Cube uh, solver <laughs> um, because she, thought, she felt that was less threatening to the, the rest of the cast. Yeah, I uh, I also did not tell anyone I was a poker player. No one no one knew that at all. I just told people <laughs> I was a a personal trainer, which you know at the time fit uh, you know fit just fine. Um, but yeah, I think <laughs> someone I think someone could still win saying they're a poker player. I think sort of to just exclude someone based on something like that is not you know that's not totally accurate. You know, like Boston Rob won you know a season where everyone knew he was Boston Rob and still just like twisted every single person around his finger, you know? So I don't think it necessarily assumes you will or will not do well. I mean, certainly I had a a series of attributes going into the show that caused a lot of poker players to bet a lot of money on me and lose, you know? So (laughs) say a bunch of attributes that one might think might be good is no guarantee, but you know, I would say the opposite as well. It's true. Let's talk about your poker career. Uh, you kind of become one of the kings of live stream poker. Um, appeared pretty much on all the shows, uh, whether it's you know Live at the Bike, the New Hustler live stream, Poker After Dark. Um, you know, I'm wondering uh, what your breakdown is as far as your division of play between games that are streamed and games that aren't. Right. Yeah. You know, it's that that uh, sort of breakdown is continue to lean more and more in recent years towards stream games. Uh, And the reality of that is like, I can provide value in a stream game. The productions themselves, um, you know, want me on because like I can do a good job for them in in attracting more eyeballs. Uh, And I mean, really in all forms of business, that's really what you're looking to do is think about how you can add value, you know, and, you know, there are other ways people get into poker games, right? Whether they be home games or privatized casino games that aren't on streams and whatever. Um, but I think because people really struggle to quote unquote add value to those games, unless they're a losing player, it's honestly like a, a really messy situation, you know, filled with crazy amounts of politics, sometimes unethical behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so a light bulb really went off for me the first couple times I played on streams where I said, oh, wow, like this is going to allow me to do exactly what I want to do. Right. Which is to play in big, good poker games and like not have to do anything where like I look in the mirror at night and don't feel great about myself. Um, and so that's kind of the nature of how it's been. And, you know, at this point, now that there's two competitors in the space in Los Angeles alone, you know, both of them running one or two big games a day. You know, I have I have more streaming games, you know, than I can handle. Now, of course, I'm playing a lot of hours after the stream, but you know, if we're calling it like that exact game, still, it's it's almost all of my play. Um, that being games that at least begin as a stream. Does your non-stream game look the same as your streamed game, or are you doing things differently for the sake of the cameras, or just to hide from the cameras? Oh, no, no, I'm, th- everything's the exact same. I mean, the reality is, is like, you know, stream games might be, let's call it 50% of my volume or maybe even more, you know, so I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be like, you know, doing anything differently. Like if that's like half of my action, right. That wouldn't, yeah. that wouldn't necessarily make any sense. Now, admittedly in the first several games I played on a stream ever, you know, did I lean towards, you know, playing super aggressive, looking to make the hero play, et cetera, you know, whenever possible. 
knowing again that would allow me to further add value to future streams of course you know but that was you know many many years ago and obviously i'm in a very fortunate position now where i just play my poker game and you know it doesn't it doesn't really matter you know i'm thankful that my natural poker game is one that people tend to find interesting um mm. that's that's not the case i think for some other winning players uh so you know i'm very fortunate in that way but now uh you know i'm making just as many big calls folds bluffs etc you know on or off stream and i think you know i play with i play with at least some opponents who you know, are skilled and savvy enough that, like, if I was doing anything but that, they would pick up on that real quickly and I'd be in a lot of trouble. Uh, you've kind of developed a reputation for, you know, having this ability to escape uh, from, you know, would, would-be setup hands. Um, and I know you told Doug Polk that you believe in white magic. <laughs> I'm wondering if if that all comes, comes into it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean... It, just so we're all on the same page here, I would define like white magic loosely as something where maybe game theory um, would often dictate making a certain play. So like in your case, if we're talking about hero folding, it would dictate like you have a hand, you know, too high up in your range or whose blockers are too strong or whatnot to consider folding. Um, But, you know, I will anyway. And and of course the opposite is true, you know, where I'll make calls where, you know, theory would kind of dictate otherwise, Uh, you know, to me, white magic is sort of just like intuition, you know, intuition really isn't just like being born with some innate skill to know when someone's strong or weak in a poker hand. Uh, intuition instead is, you know, playing poker for 20 years, almost, you know, the way I have intuition is, you know, playing thousands and thousands of live poker hands. Intuition is playing, you know, in some cases, thousands of hours with one or two or whatever single opponents where a lot of times you can't necessarily explain why your gut makes you feel like, oh, this person's strong or weak here, but it just comes, you know? And my, again, quote unquote, intuition is wrong plenty of the time, you know? But um, it is like one of the variables I use when assigning like a relative weight to a decision. Sometimes it, you know, carries a a very large weight. Uh, Many times I play hands and all, it'll assign a large weight and I will be dead wrong. And that is not super easy to sleep on those nights, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all of that. Um, but I think sort of what differentiates, let's say someone like Phil Helmuth for myself, although I guess we could probably name 10,000 things that make us not. <laughs> uh, is uh, I always want every weapon at my disposal at the poker table. So I don't, I'm not really interested in being great with, let's just loosely refer to it as white magic. I, I want to be able to, you know, be great at a variety of different skills, you know. And so as many of the best players in the world are now, you know, very, very strong theoretically or from, you know, a game theory standpoint, you know, that's something I've certainly challenged myself, you know, to become much, much better at uh, in recent years as well. It's just sort of a another weapon in, in one's arsenal. And, you know, I think it's really helpful because in certain hands I'll use one skill quite a lot in, you know, other hands I'll use the other and many it's, it's sort of a blend. Uh, and, and many times, no matter what I go with, I make a terribly wrong decision, you know, but I think one thing that does separate me from a lot of poker players is I, I really don't mind um, making a decision that let's say is, is fundamentally awful Um because I just feel strongly like it's the right play to make, you know, in that exact hand, um, which um, I think certainly makes me harder to play against. Um, even if, again, sometimes, you know, I play those hands that go catastrophically wrong and I have to deal with, you know, the, the financial and emotional consequences thereafter. You know, we, uh, we usually ask people about, you know, the hands that they went, that went viral in their career. Uh, but pretty much all of your hands are recorded, so uh, it was tough to choose. For, do you have one that stands out in your mind? Yeah, I think probably the most important hand I ever played um, was was a non-stream hand where I was in a, a series of huge games, um, and I was about hmm, maybe uh, maybe I was about twenty seven, twenty eight. Um, and you know, these games, they, they generally played like 400, 800, no limit equivalent, um, which at the time for me was, was a very big game. And I was, 
definitely taking shots in them in the beginning, um, taking 100% of my own action. And I remember I, I get in this one hand against Rick Solomon, uh, and I cooler him, obviously, because that's what I do to people. Uh, <laughs> I have a straight, and he has top set uh, on the turn, and we get it in for... I think the pot was a little over a half million. Um, so uh, just a, a huge pot for me at the time. And, you know, uh, like, I'm like, how many times do you want to run it, Rick? And he uh, he thinks about it for a minute, you know, and he just randomly says three. You know, I want to run it 100 times, but he goes three, right? So, uh, so we uh, do the first one, I lose. We do the second one, I win. We do the third one, I win. And I take two-thirds of the pot, right? So obviously, like, an incredible result. Um, but, you know, if we would have obviously done it once, which he often did, you know, I don't even know why he said three that time. You know, I just, I just lose the whole pot. And it's just one of those hands where I don't know, but I always kind of wonder if my entire poker career would have taken just a, a totally different turn, you know, with a, a half million or I guess what ended up being – We'll, we'll call it like 350,000 or whatnot, like less to my name, you know, after the hand. Um, and so those are kind of always interesting, pivotal moments that I know a lot of you listening have had, you know, hands like that, maybe that have gone your way, maybe not. Uh, and, and I think sort of there's always just this thin line in life where if you catch a break or don't catch a break, uh, you know, it, it can really sort of affect the, the trajectory for, for the rest of your life, you know, and, I don't, I don't regret at all playing in those games with, with all my own action. Like, I was well aware what a risk it was. I was well aware sort of what an incredibly profitable, incredibly profitable opportunity it was. And I remember, you know, when I was speaking to my now wife, but early years of our relationship girlfriend at the time, and she's very risk averse. And I remember even her, she goes, you got to do this. You got to go for it. Like, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll see what happens. Um, and, you know, next thing we know, I played in that game probably a thousand hours and overall probably ran extremely, extremely well. And, you know, my poker career was never anything close, you know, after after those series of, of live games. And it all came because Rick Solomon wanted to run it three times. So. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I always wonder about that. My The first home game I ever played, the first time I ever played poker was in college and I made a royal flush to scoop a big pot. And I'm pretty sure that's why I'm talking to you now. You know what I mean? <laughs> if For I had sure. lost that session, I don't think I would have played again. For um, sure, yeah. The the butterfly effect is so endlessly fascinating. And, of course, it can take you down some rabbit holes mentally that maybe you don't always want to go down. But uh, I personally think it's, you know, I think it's a lot of fun. And I remember when I was a kid, even though it's a poorly made movie, I remember <laughs> watching the butterfly effect and being like, this movie's brilliant and this is, like, exactly what poker is. You know, I found, like, a lot of similarities. So. Ashton Kutcher, he punked for us all. For sure. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, well, you know, now that you brought up cash games, we have some some questions here. What's the biggest pot you've ever won or lost? Mm, yeah, I don't think I can answer that. I, actually, I would say most of the biggest games, pots, et cetera, I've played uh, have been off stream. Um, you know, one in one sort of very long series of sessions, I ended up, um, you know, I don't know why that rang. Sorry about that. Um, it's all good. <laughs> uh, I ended up uh, playing someone, you know, heads up, and we probably played, you know, a few hundred hours or whatever. But uh, many of those pots uh, were, were, you know, the, the biggest I played. We were playing uh, 1,000, 2,000 for almost the entirety of that time. So, yeah. You could imagine. All right. So what about the biggest stakes you ever played? Was that the, was that the biggest game? Um... If not that, probably close to that. Yeah, 1K, 2K, 2K, 4K is probably uh, the biggest I've played. But, again, because there was so much volume at that 1K, 2K, you know, when I was playing those heads-up sessions, those are certainly the most memorable huge games, you know, I ever played. And, and I think, you know, maybe that's worth sort of bringing up something slightly tangential, you know. Unfortunately, uh, the biggest I get to play a lot of times now is like, you know, one-tenth that, right? Even if we get the straddle going, it's like a $100, $200 game. And, you know, I'm often asked like, well, how do I, how do I get up for a game like that? Well, how do I care, you know? And I, I think in a list, in, the, in like an endless list of challenging things that one needs to overcome mentally in poker, I think this is like, you know, yet another one. And 
it's sort of important, I think, when you're playing to like reset, start a new reality when you're playing at stakes much different than whatever you were before. Um, yeah. To ensure, you know, you're still able to play well. Now, you know, if I could still play 1K, 2K every time I played poker, like, of course, I'd be doing it. But that's not real life, you know, and real life is me getting to play again on average, sometimes a little bigger than this, but on average, like one tenth those stakes. And I'm still super grateful for that. Those are still very big games and they're often very good games. And so, you know, I sort of over time chose to adapt, you know, that mindset, however challenging, you know, that may be. Right. You still have to approach it with the same mentality. Absolutely. Yeah. Can't, can't give it away just because it's a tenth as big. All right. Um, you, uh, you mentioned, you know, obviously not, you're not a flashy person, you know, obviously, uh, you, you're thinking about charity in these moments instead of your, your big wedding. But I'm wondering if you ever did a treat yourself moment after a big win. If you ever went and uh, picked up uh, something a little for yourself. Yeah, I, you know, yes, probably did, you know, some of that over time. I think the the single sort of biggest purchase I make, as is common for most people, was, um, you know, the my first house. And then also, you know, my wife and I, um, bought a new house about a year ago as well. Um, and I think both of those, I think, were, were, were really sort of sentimental moments for me, like in a bunch of ways. But I'm going to connect it sort of to probably what a lot of your listeners are, are most interested <laughs> in, you know, which is like, you know, when I bought that first house, um, you know, like, uh, and you know, I can say now, I think I, we bought it for like a little under like 1.5 million or something. I did that maybe seven years ago. Um, it was just like a sign to me that like, I, I had really like made it, like I had really turned like this passion of mine into like a, a real life that allowed me, you know, financial, financial freedom, you know? And at the time it was just like, so much more than I could, you know, ever have, have dreamed of, uh, in terms of like home ownership and, and everything like that. And, and so I think I really did wear that home as like a, a real like badge of pride, um, for what, you know, what I was able to do with poker. And, you know, I, I often don't really talk about this and it can kind of come across sort of a, a certain way if you do, you know, um, but, you know, again, our, our newer house is sort of like, it's kind of like three times the other one, you know, in, in every way. Uh, and it's not the same, honestly, it, it's not the same. Like I, 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 of course I love our house, you know, I'm grateful for it, et cetera, but it was buying that first home, buying that first primary residence where I said, you know, I have built a physical home. I have built a life. I don't think I ever really have, have felt more pride than that. And I hope for, for all up and coming poker players, I hope that they're able to, experience you know that feeling and it doesn't need to be a 1.5 million dollar home you know it can be you know something much smaller much more reasonably priced but i think being able to own a home as a result of playing a card game uh is in in many ways to me very baffling and very rewarding i mean the fact that you even brought up a house shows just how level-headed you are in in that regard i mean i've had people on this show tell me that they want a hundred and 10,000 in a tournament and then they spent 90 the next day on a car. You know what I mean? Yeah, or, sure. or, or their watch that they went immediately after final table, uh, that they final tabled an event. They immediately put it all on a watch <laughs> at the casino that they were in, <laughs> you know? Uh, so this seems uh, pretty reasonable to me, making sure you have a roof over your head. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I think a, a home just in general for people, it, it can carry a lot of emotional connection, you know, like speaking of like, you know, the current home, that my wife and I bought, like, I'm like so emotionally connected to it, not just based on the past year of memories, but that I know we'll be raising our future family in this home. And I know we're just going to just have like, you know, almost all of the most special moments in my life are going to take place in this physical building. Uh, and, you know, that, that means quite a lot to me, you know, with that all said, you know, it wasn't like, you know, in my late teens and early 20s where, you know, I first made $50,000 in a day playing poker, I didn't go out and, you know, just blow it on drinks or this or that, you know, but over time, you kind of learn the things that really, like, add value to your life and don't, you know, uh, and 
thankfully, um, you know, spending is one of the, the areas I kind of like figured out like how to do in a way that like benefited me, you know, a, a bit more early on, you know, and I did a lot of reading, you know, in my 20s, you know, on all of this stuff in terms of like extrinsic versus intrinsic sort of motivation or or even spending, you know, and so I learned quite quickly both through literature and experience, you know, when you go and you buy like, you know, the Louis Vuitton shoes, like who, like, who are you doing that for, you know, and, and all you're really doing is you're just desperately trying to seek the approval from others. And no matter how many pairs of shoes you have, no matter how many nice things you have, you know, what you come to learn is the approval of others is always fickle, right? You can mm. never count on it. Uh, and you learn it also means nothing. You know, but if you can do things and specifically make spending choices that actually add value to your life, things that you feel good about, things you're doing for you, uh, though, I, I think that's really that's where the nectar is. That's where, you know, you're able to make choices where, um, you know, it, it can actually enhance your life, you know. And so it's interesting because a lot of things can be sort of both, you know, buying like a you know, a new construction home that could be both intrinsic or extrinsic or both. And, and you really kind of got to, you got to be honest with yourself when, when trying to navigate. Right. Is, you know, yeah. We have some uh, rapid fire questions to close sure. things out here. If you're ready. Sure. Let's do it. Um, biggest punt. Is there, is there a, a moment that haunts you <laughs> that you still think about? Hmm. Huh. No, I don't, I don't think so. You know, there was one main event where after like day four, I was like third in chips or something. And day five, I just played really bad all day. And then I ended up getting in this like ridiculous hand where like I just get moved to the table and Johnny Chan's on my immediate left. I open the cutoff with Queen Jack off. He three bets the button and we have like 60 big blinds or something insane. And I just like snap ship because I'm just super tilted and desperately struggled with emotional control at that point in my life. Of course, he snaps me off. He wins. And the ESPN cameras caught it because they had interviewed me that year and, and they kind of showcased me a little bit. Um, so, you know, I can remember that one because it was like on TV. But it's <laughs> like it probably wasn't that many dollars overall. You know, there were still 150 people or whatnot left in the tournament. But I remember at the time that one haunted me very, very badly. So <laughs> since it's around the main event time, I'll throw one of those out there. Uh, best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Has anybody come through mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, great question. So I almost never, ever swap with anyone. Um, but that same main event, uh, I um, was very good friends with Jason Senti, and we both went super far. And so after that day four, I'm third in chips. He is like a middle stack, uh, and he wants to swap. And I go, no, like I don't feel like dealing with the math and whatever. And he goes, dude, we really should swap. Like it reduces the variance like a ton for us. You know, and so it like the math worked out basically where uh, I had 5% of him uh, and he got 2.5% of me and he ended up final tabling and he got like 6th or 7th uh, and I think I made like 75000 or something on that, which is by far the biggest swap I've ever had because I just don't play tournaments and I don't swap. Uh, <laughs> the last, there you go, I do have one swap story. Weirdest place you've ever played poker for money? Definitely the, the the first one that comes to mind is in that game that I was mentioning to you, uh, where you know Rick Solomon was in on this session. You know, again, a thousand, two thousand hours total. Many times we used to play in this like three, four table, like ghetto middle of nowhere card room in Chula Vista, south of San Diego, where the table <laughs> next to us was only playing one, two. We hired like armed guards, like three armed guards just stood around our table and we would just play this game for like 36 48 hours we probably did that 25 times but every time i was like this is the most ridiculous shit ever like <laughs> how did i get here in life but that is by far without question uh the the most random place i played many times it doesn't have to be bobby's room you know what i mean like sometimes the biggest game is in chula vista right oh for sure no bobby's room is boring right it's just like <laughs> gourmet food and video cameras everywhere there's nothing interesting about that this is this is where the real shit is uh, speaking of which, what's your longest session? Probably about 72 hours. Um, I, I find that, like, 
right around there is where like my brain could no longer function at all. But with that said, I probably have maybe a hundred uh, sessions between 24 and 48 hours. It's something that is kind of the nature of the beast of super high stakes poker and something I've always taken great, great pride in is ensuring that although I won't play as well as on hour one, that, that I am able to play significantly better than my opponents who are also similarly overtired. Do you have like a routine when that happens? Are you like doing jumping jacks next to the table or how are you, how are you staying awake? I'm, I'm mostly just thinking about like, um, like who I want to be as a man, to be honest. Like there's this book by David Goggins called Can't Hurt Me, which I love. And he talks about this infinitely better than I ever could. But in all things in my life, but especially these, these sessions that we're referring to where it's so challenging to be playing well when you've been up for two days, I just think like what separates me? What makes me uncommon amongst the un- uncommon? And so there's just like a lot of self-talk, you know, in those sort of moments while everyone else is just like, they're just like zoned out. You know, they're like literally just like trying to stay awake. They're trying to like not make a terrible mistake, et cetera, where like my mindset's just always kind of been the opposite. Like I want to play even better than I did on hour one. You know, I'm probably not doing it, but it's really just like a a mindset thing. Um, and, And I think most of the skills that I have in life, I've like learned through hard work. This is one that's, that's always kind of just been innate within me for, for better or worse. That's, that's fascinating. Are you one of those people who like psychs themselves up in front of a mirror? No, it's not like that. It, 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 so what it would be would be like, that would be like the physical manifesta- manifestation of what I'm thinking, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, okay. So okay. I don't need to like psych myself up in a mirror, but in my own head, I suppose that is what I'm doing. You're the best. You can do it. You're, you're a machine. They can't stop you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I would say I do have some of those thoughts, but I'm never saying them aloud. <laughs> <laughs> you should do it on the stream one day. Just yeah. really confuse people. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, positive self-talk, I think, can have a lot of value in, in poker and in life. What was your worst job before poker? Oh, wow. It's so many. Um... Probably it was my first like official job. I did umpiring before this, but um, again, this is in Tucson, Arizona, and most places wouldn't hire you till you were 16. But this one like assisted living facility would hire 15 year olds as servers, right? And there was no money exchange. You were just your server, and you know they paid for a meal plan and whatever. But so I was a server for all these old people, and so many of them were so mean and cranky and verbally <laughs> abusive, and it was just. And it was for minimum wage. It was just such a terrible, horrible job. And yet I'm so grateful for it. You know, like my kids will definitely, definitely be working terrible minimum wage jobs too. I think it builds so much character. And, you know, I'm really glad I had a a sea of of very challenging, low paying jobs, you know, um, before I turned 18. Was there one you liked? Yeah. You know, I like serving uh, and assistant serving. I, uh, Ended up getting an assistant server job at a nice restaurant, and then they later promoted me to server, which, like, they didn't do for, for people that young, like, ever. Uh, and I, you know, made a lot of money at that, at that job. You know, I moved all the way up to, like, where I was doing catering and was often making between 50 and and $100 an hour. Uh, and it was just a lot of fun, really fast-paced environment. Um, so, you know, the upscale restaurant business uh, is one I, I definitely really enjoyed. All right. Um, what was your largest non-poker wager? Hmm. Probably can't answer that either. Uh, but what I will say is <laughs> I used to do uh, a massive amount of degenerate things from huge sports bets where I remember one time I went to a Clippers game uh, where it was like game six against the Rockets. It was Chris Paul, you know, Blake Griffin. They were up by 20 in the fourth quarter. I had Clippers money line. Long story short, they lost the game. Oh my I, was God. With, I was, again, with my now wife. We immediately bought tickets to fly to Houston two days later to go to game seven. And I somehow put 5X as much money on that game. Uh, <laughs> this one's a lock. And I took the Clippers like 10 different ways, money line spread, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, we went into Houston and the Clippers got just blown out. They were down like 20-some in the first quarter. Never made a comeback. So I did a lot of that. 
I also used to do this really mature thing where anytime I'd get down a lot in a big game, I just start desperately asking everyone to flip for whatever I was down. I used to do that quite a lot. That used to get me in huge holes, just like all sorts of like self-destructive de- de- degenerate behavior that, um, that like, you know, I really just kind of had to learn these lessons the hard way and live that pain over and over and over and over again before I said, you know what, I'm kind of getting exhausted making bad choices for my life. So these days I do much less of that. I do some neutral EV gambling, but hopefully and generally not in ways that are self-destructive. That flight home from Houston sounds awful. <laughs> it, was a, it was super rough. It, it was like, yeah, it was not fun. And it was just, yeah, I just used to be like very impulsive with my behavior. And that's like just a perfect example of it. And, you know, I, I hope again for, for anyone listening and they can relate to some of this, like these are not things you just need to accept about yourself. You know, like if you put in the hard work, like you can make changes, you know, to, to live with quite a lot more peace than I mean, <laughs> these dreaded flights home from Houston, as you mentioned. <laughs> if you could name uh, the entertainment for the Super Bowl halftime show, what would you pick? Um, hmm. That'd be tough. Okay, so I'd mostly listen to electronic music, but, like, a lot of electronic acts, like, have live shows and stuff these days. So, like, I would say, like, some sort of, like, Rufus Dussault Odessa collaboration for the Super Bowl, where, of course, they're playing live. I think it's something that I certainly would love and I think would, would appeal to the masses quite a bit as well. Yeah, that'll play well in middle America for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do you have a celebrity doppelganger or have people told you you look like somebody maybe growing up? You know, not too often. There's this guy named Brad who was on The Real World like infinite ago, but probably no one will know that. Is. But I, I used to look kind of like him, people used to say. And then I get well, like I'm a bunch Googling of, it. Yeah, then I get like a bunch of others that I just like don't really agree with. Um, so no, uh, I don't. I don't really get that one. Sorry, it's not that I. I would throw it out there if I got to one. But oh yeah. my god, okay, I remember this guy because yeah. I, you know, I definitely had a real world phase. Yeah, and of course, a real we all phase and a real world versus road rules challenge phase. Um, but yes, I do remember this guy when he was younger. He kind of looks like you mixed with Scott Clements. Yeah, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. And I, now I he looks that. completely different. Yeah. I remember when I saw it, you someone in a YouTube comment recently, I shouldn't, shouldn't even say this, but it's just, it's so incredibly mean and hilarious. Someone wrote, <laughs> Jared looks like Marty Funkhauser, which I just thought was fucking hilarious. <laughs> I was like, I'm not sure you could name like a meaner, a meaner one, but I, I mean, I honestly, like, I usually try to avoid chat, comments, etc. It's better for my life. But, man, whenever I do read them, they're usually so funny. And this one just had me dying. So I like that. Oh, rest in peace, Bob Einstein. Right, right. Yep. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> Marty Funk, I'll say. <laughs> right, like, All right. so um, random, but hilarious. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, most, sorry. Do you like telling people you're a professional poker player? Let's say you get in a in a lift and they mm-hmm. say, "What do you do?" Do you lie yeah. or tell the truth? No, so I would definitely still say no. I mean, I I used to say no for like twenty different reasons, including like I was embarrassed about it. Now I'm not embarrassed about it. It's just kind of like the conversation's a little bit boring, repetitive, etc. I definitely think compared to the overwhelming majority of poker players. Um, my identity is tied to the work much, much less, um, for, for better or worse, you know, like my social media profiles have never had a picture of me, you know, playing poker. It's certainly like one of the last things I talk to people about, you know, when I meet them at a party, um, et cetera. I just, to me, it's always just kind of been, you know, the work and then, you know, the rest of my life is sort of who I am, you know, as a person. And I think in the end, again, the zero sum nature of poker, the toxicity of poker, you know, occasionally the unethical behavior amongst some in poker, it, I continue to sort of shy away from tying it to my identity too much. All right. So when they're like, what do you do? You're like, Hey, I'm a human. 
That's all you need to know. Yeah, I mean, so if someone <laughs> asks me directly now, like, and I know I'm going to be, like, talking to them for a while or whatever, I'll always just tell them, you know? But uh, when I used to be younger at a bar, I would just say, like, ridiculous shit, like, i a limo driver for B-list celebrities, or I'm a pigeon trainer, <laughs> but, like, I train, like, the best pigeons, like, in A-list movies, just ridiculous things that like hopefully would make girls laugh and like not actually ask me further like what the real question is um but you know if someone asked me in passing at a party i'll just say like consultant or you know what whatever the case you know it's it's a little harder these days like because then a lot of times someone else will come up to me at that party and be like i'm a big fan <laughs> you know so yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot more likely these days to just to just Take uh, take the bait, answer the question, and then you know deal with their twenty follow up questions that, of course, every poker player gets. Are you superstitious at all? No, not not even in the least. Do you have a nemesis, somebody you can't beat, or somebody who's always held over you? Mm, no, I don't. No, I don't. I don't really. The problem is I don't really play with any like one person enough, like where, like, we both haven't gotten the best of each other a million times. You know, I know everyone listening to this probably wants me to just say, like, Andy, because we have a lot of hands against each other. But he's not he's not a nemesis for several reasons. First of all, we both win plenty of big hands off each other. But, you know, we're friendly. We're friends. He's a nice person. Like, I feel like for someone to be a nemesis, I would have to dislike them. And that's definitely not how I feel. That or, or just lose repeatedly to them. If it's, if it's even, then... That doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, I get what you're saying. I think it's like Andy and I have played so many hours that to lose repeatedly would be like almost impossible, you know. But yeah. I get what you're saying. I'd like to think my mindset these days is such that like if someone was really holding over me in hands, it wouldn't like affect my personal feelings about them. But who knows? Maybe some new hotshot will come and just beat me out of, you know, 95 out of 100 hands and I'll, you know, dream about taking them out or something. <laughs> <laughs> So I was able to find your survivor profile online. It said that oh, you God. were in, it said that one of your interests was cinema. So um, do you have a favorite film? And also, do you have a favorite movie? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, for what it's worth, when I wrote that thing, like production was like, yeah, just be obnoxious and sarcastic as possible. So I actually <laughs> the word cinema like facetiously, even when I wrote that. But no, I absolutely love, love so many TVs and TV shows and movies. Uh, unlike a lot of sort of successful people who like brag about how they don't do any of it because that's like what makes them crush life. I've always found these two mediums to be very relaxing and help me decompress from an otherwise very high anxiety existence. To answer your question specifically, there's so many movies I love, but <laughs> when, when gun to my head, I'm asked about this, I usually go with Memento, which I thought was just the, one of the most brilliant movies ever made. I, I, I'm right with you on Christopher Nolan. Yeah. I always told people The Prestige was my favorite movie until Whiplash came along. But now, right. still uh, top Whiplash five. is, by the way, since you brought it up, another exceptional movie that I right? love so much. And Whiplash is a movie I connect so much with in terms of, you know, that crazy, you know, teacher. Session. That, yeah, that used to be me quite a bit. And I've tried to sort of rein that back, you know, in recent years. But I remember when I first saw Whiplash, I thought the the teacher, what's his name? Uh, is it J.K. Uh, what Simmons? Yeah. Yeah, J.K. Uh, Simmons. Yeah, yeah. I thought, like, I was, like, obsessed with his character. And I thought, like, irrelevant of what the movie was trying to say, that that guy was, like, an absolute hero. That's sort of, like, the way I viewed life, you know, at that time. Uh, but nevertheless, an exceptional movie that everyone should watch. Right, I, I think I felt the same way when I watched it. Where I went, I could see his point, you know, and like, and I think a, a lot of people saw that movie and they went too far. I've never had anybody in my life like that, but I've had people like that. I've had teachers like that, coaches or people who just drive and push you, and ha and those people who can't relate to the movie have also never obsessed about one thing enough. Totally. To the point like that guy did with drumming. I don't know. Totally, totally. Yeah, I think probably a lot of poker players can relate. And I mean, to this day, like the quote, like the two most dangerous words in the English language are good job. Like, yes, I, I still just get like, uh, yeah, like I, I, I get passionate even thinking about that sentence. I just thought it was such beautiful writing. That's great. All right. Um, a few more and then I'll let you go here. 
Uh, you just answered one, which is which movie quotes do you use on a regular basis? <laughs> um, do you have a favorite gambling movie, though? Uh, I would just say, like, you know, the typical ones. But I, I did love both Molly's Game and Rounders. I thought they were great movies. Uh, you know, I, I think I'll pivot off that just a little bit uh, and speak on Molly's Game. You know, I love Aaron Sorkin. I absolutely love Jessica Chastain. And I just watched her in Scenes from a Marriage with Oscar Isaac. And I thought that was just absolutely brilliant acting. And, and Chastain is, has always been one of my very favorite actresses. So if I had to pick one, it would definitely be Molly's Game. I, did, I saw them together in something else a few years ago. Uh, 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 a Most Violent Year is another that's incredible right. movie they both starred in. That movie's incredible. Yeah. Well, that, you know that work together is going to pay off again. For sure. Um, what's uh, your biggest pet peeve at the table? I know you just tweeted about the pace of play at the main yeah. event. It's that, not even close. Pace of play. Especially in 2021, pace of play is everything, you know? And so the combination of the shot clock as well as playing in super good games like I play in, like, I mean, it, it makes playing just such an enjoyable thing. Whereas, like, I can't even watch other poker, um, let alone play, because it's just so incredibly slow, you know? And so... Yes, I think there needs to be shot clocks in all big cash games, all big tournaments, including the main event. And, you know, for my money, the more aggressive those, you know, that time bank is, those shot clocks are, I think the better it is for poker. I think the better it is for recreational poker players. I think the better it is for poker as something people can watch on TV, which I think is a huge piece of the industry continuing to thrive. So for all of these reasons, I'm so, so passionate uh, about shot clocks. I remember, you know, Ryan Feldman at the company he was at, now at Hustler, I said years ago, I said, Ryan, we have to get a shot clock in here. You know, he immediately made it happen in a week. And ever since then, you know, every stream game I've ever been in, even every off stream game I've been in has a shot clock and the quality of my um, time while playing poker, it's just like, night and day, you know, different since then. So I know shot clocks have really made a big push, but my hope is they become more and more and more commonplace. That, as well as antis, these two things are just absolutely critical to No Limit Texas Hold'em continuing to thrive. All right, pivoting one more time away from poker, if you could call up anyone in the world and have a one-hour conversation, who would you, who would you call? I guess I would say Barack Obama. I could give a hundred people, but this is rapid fire, right? I got to just decide. Yeah, I yeah. Think, uh, you know, Obama is someone who I just admire and respect, you know, for for so many different reasons. But both because of his sheer brilliance, as well as, of course, the the very uh, you know fascinating life he's lived. I, I'm sure that hour would be about as groundbreaking as it gets for me. Yeah, even if you didn't agree with him, he would know so many secrets. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I yeah, I know I'm isolating plenty of your viewers by giving that answer, but alas. No, I don't think it, I don't think it's plenty. I think it's a small minority. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, uh, we end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. Here we go. RNG, not just for poker, right? <laughs> if you were a king, what would your throne look like? Oh, wow. Well, that's a, I'm that's assuming it wouldn't be a bunch of swords. Yeah, I think it would. Uh, I, I guess I would just try to make it look sort of as commonplace as possible to help try to symbolically illustrate that, like, I want to lead the people by being like the people and not sort of being above them in some sort of mm. superficial or materialistic way. It's kind of a corny answer, but sort of the first thing that came to my mind. Bring me the chair of a commoner. No padding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just some sort That's of like a, middle middle class hut is where the throne would be, you know, just to just to try and show people I'm down to earth, you know. Yeah, he rolls up his sleeves and gets dirty like the rest of them. There you go. What what a good king Garrett is, King Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> that that is a nickname I really hope does not stick. Please, please King G-Man. King G-Man. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a huge LeBron James fan, but I think having the word king before your name is as pathetic and douchey as it gets. <laughs> so I want no <laughs> All right. Well, maybe, maybe just for one day you can change your Twitter handle. Um, 
Garrett, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing the stories. No worries. I had a great time. Appreciate you, man. All right, that's it. That is the show. I want to thank Garrett for spending his one interview of the year with us. Make sure you follow him on Twitter, at G-Man Poker. And, of course, you can catch him playing cards on many of the live stream cash games out there now. You can follow us at Card Player Media and also at Poker underscore Stories. Make sure you hit the subscribe button for more poker stories. And if you want to go the extra mile, please leave a five-star rating and review. Let us know you did so with an email to PokerStories at CardPlayer.com and we'll hook you up with a free digital subscription to CardPlayer Magazine.